verse 38 says, Now as they were traveling along, he entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister called Mary who, had, who was seated at the Lord's feet listening to his word. But Martha was distracted. Think about this is a famous uh, scene involving these sisters and Mary chooses to sit at the feet of Jesus, but Martha is distracted. Uh, you know, we can get distracted, can't we? We can lose sight of, of who God is and we can lose sight of what's most important and we can lose sight of uh, who Jesus is and we can get distracted with life and worries and troubles and the flat tire and whatever it is, we could become easily distracted. We could become distracted by people who hurt us, distracted by others, and we could miss out on sitting at the feet of Jesus. You know, this song, I love it. It just says, all I want to do is sit at the feet of Jesus. That's all I want to do. That's all I want to do. Um, today, we're talking about how to know God. What does that look like? How do you know you know God? Like really know God? What does that look like? I'm so excited about this message, guys. I wear this shirt today. Um, it, says, uh, it says this. What does it say here, guys? It's a miracle that we can breathe. And in the back says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Now this shirt is really special to me. Isn't it a miracle that we can breathe? Aren't you grateful to God that God has put breath in your lungs right now? By His grace, He's put breath into your lungs. And He cares about you. He loves you. Oh, thank you, Jesus. I'm so grateful that your uh, love is, is so beautiful and great. Uh, it's unfailing love. It's a love that doesn't walk out. And, it's a love that never gives up. And I'm grateful that your love will reach us wherever we're at. Whatever dark place we're at, your love can reach us. Whatever place of hurt we're at, your love can reach us. I'm grateful, God, that you're a God of new beginnings. I'm grateful nothing is impossible for you. And right now, we just, together, we just say we need you, Jesus. Move in every heart, in the heart of every person who's watching this online and in the heart of every person who's in the house. Have your way. And would you just tell God, God, change my heart. Make that your prayer. Tell him, God, I want to know you. I want to know you at a deeper level. Make that your prayer. Change me. Thank you, Lord. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Before you sit down, turn to the person next to you and just tell them God loves you. Yeah, can you do that? Tell them God loves you. Then you can have a, have a seat. Thank you, worship team, for leading us in worship. It's always good to just worship. Oh, it's so good. I'm excited about this message. Anybody excited about this brand new series called How? I'm super excited about it. We're going to be looking at some questions that we might have asked others or have asked ourselves. But um, um, I love looking up. Anybody like looking up? Uh, when I look up, I feel small. And uh, let's just look up for a little bit. Here's our Milky Way. Uh, did you know there's 200 billion trillion stars in the universe? Or 200 sextillion? You get to a point where you're like, I don't know what that means. You know what I mean? That's just like, I don't know what that means. 200 billion trillion stars. Our, our galaxy, our Milky Way galaxy is so big, if you try to cross it from one point to the other point, it would take 100,000 years to travel it. You feel small? The sun is so big that if it was a hollow, a hollow ball, you can fit up to a million Earths into the sun. Feels a lot closer here in Colorado, doesn't it? Uh, in dark matter, dark matter is believed to be responsible for 85% of gravity in the universe, and nobody knows how it works. It's a mystery. 85%. 85%. Psalm chapter 19 says this, The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day, they continue to speak 
Night after night, they make him, what church? Known. That you have this God who wants you to know him. And every time we look up, we could be reminded that, you know, God is so big and he's so great. And I can't understand everything out there. Everything stays in this order. And, and, and yet God cares about my little old life. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? God cares about your life and my life. And he, he cares about it when we're running late to work. He cares about it when we have that whatever it is problem, that leaky faucet. I mean, God cares about the details of our life. God is love. Boy, I'm so glad you're here at church today. I'm expecting God to move in a great way, great way. Romans chapter 1, verse 20 says this, For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. It pleases God when you look up and you see things that you just don't understand. It pleases God when you seek him out. That's what he wants. Would you need to hear this? Every time you look up, it's God's invite for you to know him. That's what God wants. That's your greatest aim in life, to know God. God wants you to know him. Last week, we interviewed a bunch of people as they were walking into Ace Hardware and the liquor store out there, and, and I so appreciate their willingness to participate. We asked them, we asked them, how do you know, uh, or how do you know God? And and the answers were really, really genuine. Someone said that would be impossible. That would be impossible. Another person said, I don't know. Another person said, I went, I went through um, H E double L hockey sticks and back, and just found out I'm going to be a father. So in his mind, because he was going to be a father, that's how like, okay, God exists. Someone said, uh, you just feel him all around you. Some, you know, someone said that. The other person said, uh, I don't know if I do know God. Such honesty. I love the honesty. And then someone else said, everyone has a right to feel what's right. Greg Laurie said, you were placed on earth to know God. Everything else is secondary. Everything else. In fact, when you know God, all of your problems change. You need to realize that. All of your problems change. Um, the, the, you don't worry as much because you recognize how great and how big and how awesome God is, and you recognize he loves you and he cares for you, and then you don't, carry, you don't worry and stress about all these other things that happen in your life. Book of Acts, chapter 17, there's this group of people that were trying to figure out who God was, and you read about it. It's famously known as a sermon on Mars Hill. And Paul the Apostle was on one of his missionary journeys, and he traveled to Athens, Greece. And while he was in Athens, he looked around and noticed they did not know God. So uh, chapter 17, he says this. So Paul, standing before the council, addressed them as follows. Men of Athens, I noticed that you're very religious in every way. For I was walking along, and I saw your many shrines, and, and one of your altars had this inscription on it, to an unknown God. This God whom you worship without knowing is the one I'm telling you about. He is the God who made the world and everything in it. Since he is Lord of heaven and earth and he doesn't live in man-made temples and human hands can't serve his needs for he has no needs, he himself gives life and breath, hello, to everything and he satisfies every need. Aren't you amazed, like, like birds have food? Aren't you amazed with that? Just how God takes care of everything. He's an amazing God. Verse 26 says, From one man he created all the nations throughout the whole earth. He decided beforehand when they should rise and fall, and he determined their boundaries. His purpose was for the nations to seek after God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. And then can we just read that last part out loud, guys? Though he is not far from any one of us. John Orkberg wrote this book called God is Closer Than You Think. And I wholeheartedly believe that. This verse 27 just jumps off the page for me. You have this group of people in Athens who prided themselves in knowledge, prided themselves in acquiring knowledge and intellect. They prided themselves, but yet they were very religious. This passage tells us you can be religious and not know God. 
This passage tells us you can go to church and not know God. Or you can know about God and really not know God. So this group of people is there and Paul shows up and he looks around and he sees this thing, this inscription says to an unknown God and, and he feels compelled by the spirit of God to speak to them and he tells them, you know what, this is God's will for you to seek after him and feel your way toward him and he's really not far. You realize God is closer than you think. God is closer in your life than you think. God sees you. He knows you. He knows your thoughts. He knows whether you slept all night last night or you got up at three in the morning. God knows you so well. He knows your worries and your pain and your hurt and your anger. He knows everything about you. He knows you. I noticed this, this phrase that they're religious in every way. I think the bigger question is this, is it possible to not know God and not know it? Is it possible to not know God but convince yourself that you know God and you really don't know him. But I mean, I think that's a more dangerous place. Another, word, another way to say it, you know, like what's worse, knowing that you don't know God or claiming to know God, but not know God. Which one's worse? So you can mentally know God and not be transformed by his word. You could mentally know, yep, I, I recognize, you know, these commandments are important and yep, I recognize them, but yeah, and you can believe that in your mind. You can intellectually say, I agree with that. I, I do believe there's a God of the heavens. I do believe that the stars are created. I do believe that God is giving me be breath. And we could know that mentally and, and our own life not be changed by that reality. We can go to church and sing incredible worship songs about amazing grace or how great thou art or, or whatever song it is that we sing. And you can sing, sing all these words and sing all these lyrics, but it may not really change your heart. So we can know God mentally, but on a personal level, be unchanged. We can do that. We can do that. This phrase, how you feel God. You know, I think a lot of us, and when, you, when you think about how do you know God and, or how do you know his presence, sometimes we might think, well, I was on a hike in the mountains and while I was on the hike in the mountains, there was this cool breeze that came across my way and I just felt God. You know, we have these little moments where we think, oh, that was God. Or I was listening in the car and, and this song came on and I loved this song and I got emotional and teary eyed and that was just God in there. Really? Or maybe you were watching a movie and it was a good chick flick, whatever it was, and you're watching it and you just started, you know, one moment you got emotional and you thought, oh, God met with me in that movie right there. And, and uh, you know, and that I just, you know, God just visited with me. Sometimes we can convince ourselves that knowing God is some sort of mystical experience where our senses are heightened to what it might be kind of thing. So, so knowing God can be very subjective. In fact, if I say who God is, let's just pretend for a little bit. If I determine who God is, then I can do some wonderful things. Then I will always find a God who agrees with me. You hear that? If you get to determine who God is, you will always find a God who will agree with you. You will always find a God who will never argue with you. Isn't that awesome? He'll never argue with you. He will agree with everything you think. He will agree with, uh, with, with everything, everything, you, your conclusions. He'll rarely say anything that offends you. You're God. If you create your own God, he will project your wishes. Whatever your wishes are, that's God's will. That's the God you're creating. He won't argue with you. And, and there will be very little transformation in your life. It's possible to convince yourself to make up your own God. And you start, you start, you know, talking to him or whatever it might be, but he's really a God who agrees with you. So you can mentally believe and have little transformation you know, it's one thing to look in, look in scripture and say, okay, you know, I, I, I do believe we're all... We're all sinners in need of a savior. We can say that, but we can also exclude ourselves from that human race. Say, not me. Other people are worse than me, not me. Other people, they're far bigger. Other people, they need this message, not me. I don't need that message. Jeremiah, the Lord says this in Jeremiah. 
If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. Isn't that beautiful? It's a promise from God. If you look for God, with all of your heart, you will find him. So that's the game changer right here. Some of you are going to look for God with all of your heart. Maybe at a whole new intensity after, after this message, and maybe you online, whatever it is, and you, you're like, I'm going to seek God like I've never sought him before. I want to know him. I'm not going to eat breakfast until I, ha- until I, until I just spend time. I'm, I want to know God and nothing else matters in my life. I want to know him. And God rewards that person who seeks him with all their heart. He rewards them. He rewards them. Psalm 42, David said, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Is that where you're at? God wants you to seek him out. I like what Tozer said. To truly know God, we must long for him without any other motive than reaching God himself. To truly know God, you got to want him. You got to want him and you got to seek him with all of your heart. Are we there yet? Are we getting, are we getting close church a little bit? I hope I'm, I'm trying to start a flame inside of you. I'm trying to fan it a little bit. My hope and prayer is there's this new fire that happens inside of you and you're thinking, I want to know God more. I want to know him. I, I just, nothing else matters. We're having dinner with some friends last night at P.F. Chang's. I love P.F. Chang's. And while we were there, while we were there, I told them, I just want to know Jesus more. I've been walking with Jesus for a long time. Some of you have been walking with God for a long time. But you know what? I want more. Anybody with me? I want more. I want to know God more. And the older you get, the more you recognize how short life is, right? Hello. The older you get, the more you recognize, you know, you start thanking God for your breath. You start thanking God for your knees, whatever it is. But the older you get, you recognize we have a God who is great and big and my time on earth is short. I want to know God more. I want to know God more. Let's look at Jesus because if you want to know God, you got to look at Jesus. Hebrews chapter one says, long ago, God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. And now in these final days, he has spoken to us through his son. God promised everything to the son as an inheritance, and through the son, he created the universe. There it is. The son radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God. Oh, that's so big. Jesus is God in the flesh. And he sustains everything by the mighty power of his command. When he had cleansed us from our sins... He sat down in the place of honor at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. There's the whole message of the gospel right there, all the way from creation to the cross, to the resurrection. The whole, the whole message of the gospel is right there in Hebrews chapter, chapter 1, verse, first three verses right there. The famous verse that we may have heard of growing up, chapter 3, verse 16 of John says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Now, a lot of you can quote that, and let me just say it like this. Just because you can quote something doesn't mean you actually believe in it. So you can quote it and say, yep, I know that one. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So you can say those things mentally, agree with it, but in your heart and in your life, be unchanged. You know what the devil doesn't want you to do? The devil doesn't want you to believe. He doesn't want you to believe. Because if we, if we assume knowing God is all based on knowledge, and we can read a book or watch a movie or whatever it is, or go occasionally to church and hear this message and think, yep, I know But God doesn't want you to just know. Knowing is important. He wants you to believe. He wants your whole belief system to change in light of who he is. That's your God. Jesus said this. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. It's amazing. I was talking to a friend who was uh, an atheist, and I quoted him, John chapter 14, verse 6. Told him that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. If you want to know God, it requires faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And it, it happens through the person of Jesus Christ. 
It happens through him. So you get to know Jesus and you'll get to know God. John chapter 10, verse 30, Jesus said, the Father and I are one. And in chapter eight, he says, if you knew me, you would also see my father. Jesus makes this incredible claim that sets him apart from any other religious figure. He says, if you see, if you see God, you see me. If you see me, you see God. We're, we're, we're one. That's what he's saying. We're one. And Acts chapter four says, there is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. Glory to God. So you need to get to know Jesus. I think there's someone sitting here right now or someone watching online that just needs to hear that. You need to get to know Jesus. You need to get to know Jesus. You need to understand all all problems start as a spiritual problem. And if you get to know Jesus, it'll change your marriage. It'll change your home. It'll change your, your happiness. It'll change your joy. It'll change your worries. It'll change everything. You get to know Jesus and Jesus will take care of all the matters of your heart. So what are some signs that someone knows God? First John chapter two is where the Lord led me. The apostle John says it like this. We can be sure that we know him if we, what church? If we obey his commandments, we can be sure that we know him. If someone claims I know God, but doesn't obey God's commandments, that person is a liar and is not living in the truth. So how do you know God? This word know, incidentally, in the original Greek language, you know what it means? It's not just know, it's know experientially. That's what it is. So it's not just head knowledge, it's know experientially. People who know God have personally experienced God in their daily life. They haven't read a book about it, though they may have, but they have experienced God Gnosticism with a G, gnosis is the Greek word for knowledge. Agnostic is not to know. And Gnosticism had a great impact in the early church. Gnostics claimed to have a special knowledge that was hidden from other people. And they believed this, the more you know, the closer you are to God. The more you know, the closer you are to God. So let's just read more and let's just fill our head more with more knowledge. And the more we know, the closer I'm going to be with God. So if you were Gnostic, then you would believe that. But hear this, there's a huge difference between knowing about God and knowing God. Huge difference. You could know about God, but not experience him personally. You could know about God. There's this old movie, uh, I say old movie, <laughs> Good Will Hunting. Anybody remember that movie? Good Will. This is like my favorite scene right here when Robin Williams and Matt Damon were having this conversation. And, and uh, it, it, if you watch it, there's a lot of language in there, so just give you a heads up. But he says this, uh, Robin Williams says, so if I asked you about art, you'd probably give me the skinny on every art book you've ever written. Michelangelo, you know a lot about him, life's work, political aspirations, him and, and the Pope, sexual orientation, The whole works, right? But I bet you can't tell me what it smells like in the Sistine Chapel. You've never actually stood there and looked up at that beautiful ceiling, seen that. I think about that. I think that's what it's like for someone who knows about God, but doesn't know God. When you come to know God and his presence, it's a game changer. It changes your perspective of your days. Every day you wake up and the first thing on your mind is, I want to spend time with God. I want to get to know him. I love verse five of 1 John chapter two. It says this, but those who obey God's word truly show him completely they love him. That is how we know we're living in him. See, people who know God have a desire to obey God. Because they recognize, you know what? If I obey God, then I, rec- then I can I sense his presence at a greater level. If I obey God, I, I, I feel like he's with me and he's just closer. So I want to obey him because if I don't obey him, then there's this gap between God and me and I can't stand that gap. So I want to obey God with all of my heart. And when I sin, I want to turn to God and I want to repent of that sin. I want to get right with God. I want to live with him. I want to be so close to him and nothing else matters. That's what it looks like to know God. You have a desire to obey him. Whatever he asks you to do, 
Whatever he asks you to do, wants you to walk across the room, wants you to make that phone call, wants you to text someone, wants you to ask for forgiveness, wants you to do whatever, wants you to start, whatever it is, it doesn't matter because you've just discovered God is so good and he's so great. I want to please him and I want to know his presence. They need him. They value obedience. Timothy Keller said this because I thought about, you know, how do, how do you know? Sometimes, sometimes we think, well, I'm not sure if I can feel God. Let me say it like this. Once you've actually experienced God's presence, his absence is almost unbearable. In fact, a sharp sense of the absence of God is a sign that you know the presence of God. Isn't that good? When you know God is not close to you or you're not walking right with God or there's something in your life and you just sense like God is not with me. I don't feel him and I, I feel like he's absent. That's actually a sign that you know what, it, what it's like to walk with God. That's a good thing. What the dangerous part in there is if you continue to walk away from God, eventually God will say that you have your own way. You have your own way. You got your life in your hands. You go ahead and do it the way you want to do it. Let's see how it works. Then eventually life happens and things get out of control and you cry out to God because you realize you're not that big and not that smart and not that strong. And, and then you cry out to God and God just waits for you to turn to him. Glory to God. Aren't you glad God gives us breath even when we don't seek him? God gives us breath even when we use our words to, to cuss and tear other people down and, and use God's name in vain. God still gives you breath even when you use your, you use your mind to think on ungod ungodly things. When you look at people who knew God, it was always a personal experience. They discovered obedience to God equals more of his presence. Second Timothy says, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. I like what this one scholar said, study the Bible to know about God. Obey the Bible to really know God. And that's it. I mean, you can read this and say, yeah, this is good, and I don't like this, and yeah, this, I don't agree with this one, and I don't know. But if you say, you know what, God, I'm going to take your word to heart. I'm going to spend time. I'm going to meditate on your word. And you start speaking to God, and God speaks to your heart. And then you exercise. You start applying. Oh, being obedient to what God is telling you, and, and, and that, that obedience is increasingly greater in your life, all of a sudden you're going to get to know God at another level. God wants you to know him. God wants you to trust him. God wants to show you how big he is. God wants you to know that he's a great God. First Thessalonians says this, and let's just, this is a great verse to memorize, guys, so let's just read it together. First Thessalonians chapter 3, 5, 17, 17 says this, Never stop praying. Isn't that good? Never stop praying. Old King James says, pray unceasingly. Never stop praying. God wants you to talk to him all the time. And it makes sense, doesn't it? People who know God love talking to God. They talk to him all the time. And it, it makes sense because if you, if you really know God, you have a desire to talk to him. It's, a communi it's communication. God, I'm going to talk to you. Okay, God, I want to listen to what you're going to say in my life as well. I'm not just going to tell you all my wants. I'm not just going to tell you what I want you to do, God. I'm going to talk to you, but I'm also going to open my ears and keep my mouth shut, and I'm going to listen to what you say, God, and I want to talk to you in the morning, and I want to talk to you in the car. I want to talk to you all the time. People who really know God love talking to God. That's a sign that somebody really knows God. They love praying all the time because they know God. It's a relational thing. They have this relationship with God. They can't stand the idea of God's absence in their life. They need to hear from God. Oswald Chambers says, we look upon prayer as simple as a means of getting things for ourselves, but the biblical purpose of prayer is that we, get, is that we may get to know God himself. So you talk to God and you listen. It might be hard for some of us. You talk to God and you listen and you say, God, what do you want to tell me? I don't want to just tell you what I think everything is wrong, what every people, everyone else is doing wrong or all these. God, I want you to speak to me, God. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. 
and I want to obey. It's a relationship. It's a personal experience. I can't go. I get out of bed. I got to get on my knees, and I got to talk to my God. Anybody with me? Throughout the day, it's like, I got to talk to my God. I, before I look at social media, I got to talk to my God before I jump, before I fill my head with all the distractions of the world. I got to talk to my God. And so many times we just have it backwards. And when we go through problems in life, we try to fix the problems ourselves or whatever it is, but rarely do we go to God first. Husbands, don't go to your wife first. Go to God first. Wives, don't go to your husband first. Go to God first. Friends, don't go to your friend first. Go to God first. God wants you to talk to him. He wants you to learn to hear his voice. He wants you to be obedient. God, knowing God always means talking to him and listening to him. Verse 6 says, those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. So there's evidence of someone who knows God. Because the way they live is different. The words that they come out, come out of their mouth is just different. Everything about them is different. A few years ago, uh, my family and I, we took a vacation to the Bahamas. Anybody been in the Bahamas? One of the things you first realize is everybody drives on the left side of the road in the Bahamas. They all drive. I wasn't driving around, but I thought, I might get confused driving around the Bahamas on the left side of the road. But yeah, they do that. And, and you know why they do that? It's because in England, they drive on the left and when, when the British colonized the Bahamas, they wanted people to drive like they do in London. Drive like the queen. So everybody drives on the left in the Bahamas because they drive on the left in, in Britain. That's why they drive. See, people who know God drive on the wrong side of the road. <laughs> you know that? Let's put it this way. Your life should look different because it resembles your king, King Jesus. And you're in this world right now, and everybody drives on this side, but you drive on the other side because you're not of this world. And you know your God. And your standards are different from the world's standards. Your values are different from the world values. You just walk to a different beat. You drive on the wrong side of the road. It's because of your king. And the way you live your life reflects your king. And he is the one you value. He is the one you spend time with when you have coffee in the morning. He's the one you spend time with at night. He's the one that you talk to throughout the day. He's the one that, that just is with you all the time. You ever talk to God when you're in your car out loud? You ever done that? You ever just, you know, you know I do that all the time. Sometimes I'm at home and I find myself talking to God all the time. And, 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 and my, my wife or my kids would be saying, what? 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 What are you saying? I, tell them, I wasn't talking to you. I'm sorry. I was talking to my God. I need to talk to my God. Verse 7 says this. Here's John helping us out. Dear brothers, I'm not writing a new commandment for you. Rather, it's an old one. You've heard, you've had the, uh, from the very beginning, this old commandment to love one another is the same message you've heard before. Yet it is also new. Jesus lived the truth of this commandment, and you also are living it. For the darkness is disappearing, and the true light is already shining. If anyone claims, I am living in the light, that's another way to say, I know God, but hates a fellow believer, that person is still living in darkness. Anyone who loves a fellow believer is living in the light and does not cause others to stumble, but anyone who hates a fellow believer is still living and walking in darkness. Such a person does not know the way to go, having been blinded by the darkness. And John uses this phrase, living in the light. It's, it's uh, describing someone who who's, who's knows God, who's walking with God. And he's saying, you know what? It's possible that you could, I mean, it's a daily choice to seek God. It's a daily choice to talk to God. It's a daily choice to spend time in God's word. It's a daily choice to, to commit to obedience to God. It's a daily choice to say, I'm going to live by faith. And John is saying, you got to be careful because you can say, I know God, but it's not, it's not shown by the way you love others. So you can fool yourself and say, I know God, but if you hate your brother, you're a liar. You can fool yourself and say, I know God, but if you hate your sister, you're a liar. Because the more you know God, 
It changes your relationships. You love your enemies. You pray for them. You love those who've crossed you. You love those who've slandered you. You just pray for them and you recognize it's a soul issue. It's a spiritual issue. And John is warning us. He's saying, look, you know what? If you really know God, then the way you love others, the way you treat others is evidence that you know God. And the less you love, the less you know God. People who know God have an increasing capacity to love people. It's because they know the God of love. The God of love and lives inside of them. Jesus lives inside of them. And because Jesus lives inside of them, they don't hold grudges. They don't let things get under their skin. They trust the Lord. They seek God. They walk differently. And they know Jesus and that's all they, that's all they know and that's all they need to know. And everything else, everything else just kind of falls to the side because they realize all I need to know is Jesus. It's all about Jesus. All right? if, I, if, I, if Jesus just, I want, I want more of Jesus in my heart. I want more of him in my life. And I want to, I want to talk to him more. And, and you have that heart and God will reward you with his presence. And he'll show you what it looks like to walk with him and know him. I'm so excited, guys, about something we're going to be doing because it's about loving others. Hope Week. This is something we've not done, guys, ever in the life of Thorn Creek in 19 years. Uh, it's going to be September 18 through 24. September 18 is a Sunday. And for seven days, we're going to just love on people outside of these walls. On Sunday, we're going to go down in the Renaissance apartment. On that Sunday, you might want to take a picture of this, guys, because these are the things we're going to do. On Sunday, we're going to go to the Renaissance apartment. This, this is an apartment complex on 88th Street. It's kind of like little Chicago in South Thornton. That's what it is. And uh, the, these are people that we feed. Every November, we feed 5,000 people with Food for Hope. And, and this time, we're going to go there, and we're going to feed everyone. We're going to do burgers and dogs. And we're going to play games with, their, with them. And a lot of people that live there are coming out of homeless situations, coming off the streets, and they're trying to get on their feet. And, 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 and you know what it's like to need a second chance, don't you? I know what it's like. We all need a second chance. We all need the grace of God. It doesn't matter who you are or where you live or what subdivision or whether you live in whatever. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what color skin you are. It doesn't matter. We all need the grace of God. We're all made in the image of God. On Monday, it's the Refined program. That's a, we're going to take a class on, on uh, how to minister to victims of sex trafficking. That's what's happening on Monday. Tuesday, it's an urban farm providing community and education for urban youth through farming. Isn't that cool? Wednesday is Hope House, programs and housing for teen moms. And third way is housing for troubled teens. And on Thursday, Beyond Home, programs for families coming out of homelessness. That's Thursday. Friday is going to be Synergy Village, programs and housing for people coming out of homelessness. And Saturday, we're going to clean our two streets that we've adopted on Washington, over there between 136 and 144th. And then on Colorado between Washington and York Street, right around there. We're going to just walk that and clean those streets. I want to encourage you to be a part of that. Put it on your calendar and participate in as much as you can. We're going to do this back to back for seven days. It's going to be a lot of fun. So I want to give you a QR code. Here it is. This is what you can take a picture of. So I hope you get out your phone, take a picture of this and sign up for something. I love the fact seeing you guys pull out your phones. Some of you not pulling out your phones. If you don't want to pull out your phone, just pull it out and pretend you're taking a picture. And you don't have to do anything. <laughs> God bless you. God bless you, brother. Yeah, 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 yeah. And just be a part of that. Be part of, and, and, you know, loving others. If you know God, you have a desire to serve. If you know God, you have a desire to love. If you know God, you have a desire to talk to him. You have a desire to be here. Here it is. Knowing Jesus is the greatest joy you will have in your lifetime. Knowing Jesus is the greatest joy you will have in your lifetime. Nothing else matches it. Nothing else matches it. Doesn't matter what, what joy moments you put in, in right there. Knowing Jesus will change your life and nothing else matters. It'll change your face. It'll change your past, your present, and your future. Knowing Jesus is the greatest joy you will ever have. Paul said it like this, yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ 
and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with him depends on faith. I want to know Christ. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. Do you know God? Do you know God? Now, if you say yes, then the way you love should be evidence of it. Serving should be evidence of it. The way you do your life and and praying and talking to God and, and, and all those things should be fruit of that decision. Meditating on God's word. Knowing God means I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk with God and my greatest desire is to please God. I want to please God. Don't be a people pleaser, be a God pleaser. God wants you to please Him. God wants all of your heart. He wants you to walk with Him even when it's hard. Even when you're ready to walk away because of whatever, God wants you to learn perseverance, learn endurance, stay in it, stay in the fight. Don't walk away. Keep walking with God. Even if your, your feelings go up and down and your mood changes or whatever valley you're in, you stay, hold, you hold on. We walk by faith and not by sight. For the just live by what? By, by faith. Many of you, some of you know the word. The just live by faith. And God wants you to walk with him and, and, and walk closer to him. And God wants you to recognize what he's doing. I think one of the most tragic times that for me personally is, 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 is if God's moving and I don't know it. That's the, I don't want to be there. I want to I be in the front row. I want to I be a part of what God is doing. Don't you want to be a part of what God is doing? God cares about you and he cares about everyone around you. Know God. I'm going to give you an opportunity to know God. Some of you, maybe your first step is to invite Jesus into your heart. And I, I want to lead you in a prayer if you give me that honor. I'd like to lead you in a prayer. Others of you, you might consider yourself a Christian. But those people on Mars Hill, they were pretty religious too. You might consider yourself a Christian. But the Pharisees, they knew a lot about the Bible too. They memorized a lot. You might consider yourself a Christian because you grew up in church. But do you know God experientially? And are other people aware that you know God? Is there evidence that you know God? That wherever you're at, however the Spirit of God has been working in your life, this is a time right now where you can make a decision to know God. And I want to help you with that. So let's pray together. If you're ready to ask Jesus into your heart, would you say this? Say, Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. Forgive me for my sins. Right now, I, I just turn to you and I ask you to be my Lord and Savior. And I want to become a Christian. Be Lord of my past and my present and my future. And I want to walk with you. So teach me how to do that and put your Holy Spirit inside of me so that I know right from wrong. Others of you who may have said, I know God, maybe you need to say this. God, forgive me. Forgive me, God. I want to I wanna know you, God, at another level. I don't want to just tell you what I want you to do, God. Give me ears to hear your voice in my life. I want to know you relationally. I want to experience you, God. So start that fire inside of my soul. Make it burn again. Make it strong, God. Teach me to walk by faith and teach me to persevere. Teach me to stay strong, God. You are my strength. You are my joy. So God, have your way in me. Today's a new day. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Glory to God. Can we put our hands together and just say, God, we love you. Praise God.